Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Save Report. I want to step in here because we're having a, a one of those days. <laughs> um, we are happy to bring you an episode, and we have we are really proud of the fact that we have never never missed. Um, and that will be the case today as well. But unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to edge you just a little bit longer when it comes to Killers of the Flower Moon, which seems like something we've been doing to you for two years now. Um, but uh, I, for anybody paying attention lately, uh, the ongoing saga of Devin's uh, nasal cavities and the cenobites that seem to have gotten inside it uh continues um so we're uh we're doing what uh we're doing what we should do and we're, do we're taking a good rest day um you know one of the benefits of uh being completely uh, self-funded on our own little pirate radio ship out here in the ocean is uh, we get to do things like uh, self-care which is great we don't have to worry about uh, pleasing anybody um so instead we're going to present to you a time capsule episode of equal import and merit so uh without further ado let us roll Farmer's gone! It's time for the Say Report with your host, Devin Decker, and his host companion, Sejan Sarawick. Yeah! We going down to the barnyard. Oh. Just call me Big Cheese, I think was the name. I, I couldn't tell you the name of the Boombastic Rat that, let me tell you, I have no knowledge of. Uh, when we talked about Barnyard uh, 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 however many episodes ago, because this is a time capsule... Um, it was only two days in real time to put everything together for the, the, the audience members at home and their say report murder boards. Um, but honestly, when I was like, I've seen Shaggy too many times for Shaggy not to be the immediate meme when I think of Shaggy. And I mean, just Shaggy, like standing there like, they got me Mr. Bombastic. I like Freaky Girl, too. I, I mean, that, that whole Yellow album, man, I had so many copies of it. What are we talking about? We're talking about Barnyard. Um, the, the 2006, the 1990s, no, the 2006, uh, animated computer generated animated film from Nickelodeon no, movies. Computer. <laughs> yeah. Computer. We gotta, we gotta be careful with our language nowadays because you say computer generated now in the, in the time of AI and it sounds literally like the computer did this of its own accord, <laughs> which I will give you with some of the designs of some of the characters in this movie very well could have been the case. I mean, if that's where we're starting, it's, it's a time capsule episode, but we're going to start this conversation because he, Seijin hit on something that I really want to talk about, um, and then we'll explain what a time capsule is. So it'll be fun. It'll be like Rashomon storytelling, or like if Quentin Tarantino directed this episode of This Way Report. It's not hard. A time capsule is an episode recorded out of time and space. The end. <laughs> that is That is it. Sometimes I like to make it more grandiose but yes so you're hearing this because we're not available to record yet the before this monday so well that's all the stories whatever life high fives all that i fucking love the way that the humans look in this movie that is my first <laughs> opening salvo for barnyard especially when you consider yeah. that pixar um they're not great with the humans <laughs> And, and yes and no, I, 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 there's a, there's a specific style to theirs, right? And this is so not of that style. I will give you that much, right? Like, I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and talk about, like, bash on Pixar animation. <laughs> that is not no, a thing that, I'm about to sit that's here not and do. What I, that's but, um, not what I'm trying to do. Uh, but uh, in I, terms of the artistic styling of the film Barnyard, there is a beautiful ugliness to it that i so associate even to this day with nickelodeon of old right like that that classy supo like era yeah, right like I get the, that. like you know on real monsters rocco's modern life like like there is a there is a wildness to the animation ren and stimpy right really kind of really is where where you first see a lot of this because that was one of their first animators right uh, um, well the, the first three nicktoons were doug rugrats and ren and stimpy yeah, and yeah. then and Rocco Rugrats, was right? the Rugrats fourth. Is another great yeah, yeah. And the ways in which that animation is translated into this film is pretty fucking fun, right? There is a there. There is no other movie 
there that I could think of that truly looks like this. And that includes other Nickelodeon animated movies, right? Because we did have our Rugrats movies by this point. Um, also, we had, this is not the first original. Um, Jimmy Neutron had been a few years before, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this was, I think, the second original film. There, every, every other animated film of theirs was based on an existing IP of some kind, um, except for Jimmy Neutron, um, which then, of course, born an IP. And, and same for this. It's like they, they, That's what they kind of set those up to do, right? Is to then create shows afterwards. Um, I'm I'm getting way ahead of myself when I say this, but I miss this era of Nickelodeon where they would release a movie and then release a show because of the popularity of that movie. Um, yeah, I want to confirm the the year on it. I was trying to do that while you were talking, but I feel like Fairly Odd Parents kind of killed the momentum for that. But no, uh, honestly, that started in 2001. Holy shit. I, yeah, no, no. Yeah. The truth of the matter is, is that that actually didn't happen that often. That happened with Jimmy Neutron. That happened with Barnyard. I think there's a couple of other instances after Barnyard. But the majority of their animated films, at least to the point where Barnyard was released, were the Wild Thornberry movies, the, the mm -hmm. Rugrats movies. The crossover like, they between were, the two of them. <laughs> Uh, um these were these were fr again franchises that already existed that were getting these yeah. as far in in terms of like um yeah spongebob squarepants had come out at this point right again the hey arnold like these were these were things that existed before and then they got movies there was it, it, there is this kind of thought and i had the same thought that you did that like watching that that Nickelodeon was really using movies as a way to, to, to launch a ton of their stuff that was going on. Well, that wasn't happening as much as I realized, you know? Um, yeah. I, I'm trying to see if anything happened after that, because, like, they did Rango, but that didn't really go into a well, show. Well, I mean, they didn't do anything uh, until after. Rango was the next computer-generated CGI animated film that Nickelodeon Movies does after Barnyard. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's something, right? That, that, that there's that five-year period where well, they don't do anything, uh, so... Well, okay, so so to then the quality, right? That is, that is, I think, something that's important to kind of talk about as well, is the uniqueness of the, of the, of the styling kind of really does a lot of legwork in this film to make up for kind of the, the lack of skill in the actual animation, like moment to moment. It just doesn't look as good. And, and even at the time I remember watching this movie and thinking this doesn't look as good as other animated movies out. And that's not just Pixar at this point. We have DreamWorks in the picture at this point. I think Blue Sky has already come into the picture at this point, right? Like They've there, there see, are yeah. other animation. Yeah, there, there's other animation houses that are out there doing stuff that that this is kind of coming in, and you're just like, this is not the highest quality in in terms of the animation. But what they're doing with what they've got is kind of perfect, right? In a lot of ways, it, like it's the same ways in which we talk a lot about like Nintendo. Like, yeah, their games only run at 30 frames per second, but they look solid oh. compared to these games that are trying to push the edge, which look good today, but in three years, four years. That they, they they suddenly look aged, right? But then like people talk about going back to certain Nintendo games and those games still looking great now, right? So like there's this there's this balance that you have to strike as an animator in gaming and in, in film, where like do we do we go go as advanced as we can, a la say like a Pixar, like and and then risk in a few years it then not looking up to snuff because it's no longer top of the line, or do we dial back that a little bit and focus more on just stylistically just making sure it looks unique enough that it'll never really go away, right? And I and and I think Nickelodeon does a really good job in, in this movie and in Jimmy Neutron and in some of their other um, CGI stuff you know it's funny that like you talked about rango being the next thing and i would actually argue rango swings so much in the other direction at the time i remember watching rango and thinking holy shit this is like like the the texture of the skins on these various lizards and, and and creatures is like like crazy right and then going back and watching it i now feel like oh it does look a little dated and a little empty in certain areas and things his like that. eyes are whereas terrifying. barnyard didn't yeah, yeah. Rango's yeah. eyes so, bother me. Like, and and, that, and that's like <laughs> that's that's another like, confessions of Devin Decker. I've never seen Rango either. Like, that's just one of those like 2011, 2010 to 2012 were kind of this gap for me in terms of the movies that I saw. I think between you give the, me an existential crisis. 
Well, I'm sorry. I was living on like the you, ocean, that movie, Siegen. That like, movie is just no. I, for, I'm warning you if you decide to go and see it. Like, keep, like keep it, keep an eye on yourself because, like, man, the introspection that goes on after the, watching that film is something else. Well, I've, I've been going through plenty of introspection. I don't need to add anything more to it. Glad we're talking about Barnyard today. Um, but yeah, it is. What I want to say, like, I'm not trying to drag, drag Pixar, right? But up to this point, Pixar has released one, two, three, four, five, six, seven films. And in those films, the only one that is like a focus on humans is The Incredibles. So Cars, Finding Nemo, Monsters Incorporated, your Toy Story duology at the time, and A Bug's Life, they're all creating creatures. And then anytime you see something that is not one of the created creatures like a human, it's kind of uncanny valley. Uh, the humans in Toy Story, and granted, that's 1995, so that's 11 years before this movie comes out. But, like, they are so bothersome to me, any of the human characters in the first Toy Story. Um, like, Boo looks There's pretty- only three. There's a ton of kids, but notably what they do is they use the same model for Andy. They use that for model kids, for every yeah. uh, one of his friends, right? And then there's Sid, and then I believe Andy's little sister is in that one. If no, not, and, I think Andy's she's mom. in that one as a baby, right? Andy's mom is the Andy's, third Andy's one mom famously movie. does not actually show herself she entirely the movie, until the right. third film. Yeah. She's just legs for one and two. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just... Well, I mean, maybe for two, unless the flashback for Jesse, it is Andy's mom. But we can play that, you know, further down the line when we talk about Toy Story. But it, it is a thing that I noticed in Pixar films up to that point where the humans were kind of ugly. Now, I'm not saying that the humans in Barnyard are beautiful, right? Everything kind of has that, as Seijin described it, Klasky Supo early Nickelodeon animation feel to it, right? Yeah. But they lean into it. Like, it really feels like for the Pixar movies, because the humans were sort of an afterthought, that they had less care put into those models and designs. This film, the humans are a huge afterthought, right? I think, like, legitimately only two of them would be considered characters in any way, shape, or form. And that would be the the woman, the the bewitched inspired neighbor. Oh, man. I, yeah, I, I would give you I would give you four or five, depending on if you want to count the pizza bros as well. I would not count not. the pizza bros. They're beautiful though. I do love the pizza bros. Um but I, and then the cow tipper. Like those are and I guess that's because they're villains, because the farmer is also someone is but there's so much care and the, and the postman. But there's so much care that's put into all of those designs to make them feel like they fit with the world. Like, it feels like they were designed all at the same time. And, it, and that yeah. really sticks out to me as somebody who admittedly was not really watching compute any animated films at the time. Like, I but I do think that there's back. something to be said with how, um, again, Nickelodeon really, Nickelodeon animated films have a very weird uncanny valley for me in that the worlds are always very empty and kind of uh, less detailed. Whereas if you look at something in Pixar, like every inch of Andy's room is like a really well thought out ex like like world for those toys to live in, right? The ways in which yeah. the army men get around the house in the first film is like is because like there there's an actual map to that house. Whereas like there are scenes in this movie where like textures just completely disappear if anything is more than five feet away in the back. Yeah, no, it's when I say, yeah, it's, it is, it, this is not the best animation. I do want to make sure of it. But the thing that I love the design of the farmer, I think that the farmer is gorgeous with his big nose and his squat little body and the way that he moves. Like, honestly, if he were Mario's father, I would believe it. If he's Super Mario Brothers' dad or an uncle, I'd believe it. It just, it's such a good look. I really love the neighbors. I think that that woman, I mean, she's so iconic. I thought she was the farmer's wife. I didn't realize she mm -hmm. lived next door because she's, she's like, yeah, she's in a different house. Yeah. <laughs> she's one of the foils from the show and the show. It's not that I watched a bunch of episodes of the show, but you have something you want on a Nickelodeon. And then back at the barnyard comes on. It takes a few minutes before you change it because you're doing something right. Or like, I'm going to get a drink and I'll just watch this. 
So I think in the, the uh, now that uh, we live in the era of the um, of the free TV, right on on everybody's like Samsung or or Roku or whatever. There's always that free channel. Google even has one of their own. Um, I'm pretty sure Barnyard is one of those shows that 24 seven has like a channel on <laughs> on those like that kind of thing. Like there's a there's a SpongeBob channel. There's a there's a um, an odd house. What's the what's the one? Fair, um, um, the Loud House. Loud House. Loud House has a channel, and and I'm pretty sure Barnyard had one for a while too. Well, that would explain why Barnyard is not on Paramount Plus, which is honestly the weirdest thing about this whole episode for me. I'm not that I'm shilling Paramount Plus in any way, shape, or form when we do the show. It's just one that I have. And when you think Nickelodeon shows now and where the landscape of the streaming wars are as of the end of April 2024, like Nickelodeon kind of all belongs to Paramount Plus. And that's not surprising because Viacom and all of that. But when I go and I'm like, oh, we're going to watch Barnyard. We're going to do a time capsule on it. I'm The first place I'm checking is Paramount Plus, and it's not there. But also not there is back at the Barnyard. So you saying that it's got a 24-7 channel makes total sense. Because like that's, that's one weird because the- if you go to Amazon, you can't purchase back at the Barnyard. You have to, you have to sign up for Paramount Plus in order to watch it. Right, but then you so do it's that like and it's, it's not there. It's weird. Like that's it's, that shitty that Amazon is saying the only way to watch this is to pay this money, and then if you were to pay that money and then have it not be available, that would yeah, be really because that's how that's why it's like you can check out Barnyard with this, and I'm like, oh okay, and I'm like, no, well I can't do that Amazon, but it makes sense that like maybe your wires aren't connected properly. <sighs> I don't know. All I know is that this film, I really did enjoy my time with it. Uh, It surprised me in a lot of ways. Uh, But the big question that we're here to answer today is if Barnyard is Hamlet via the Lion King. And Siege, I mean, I hate to do this. I kind of disagree with that assessment of it. In the moment, I understand it. After 2 a.m., I understand it. You just want to have a quick conversation so that this person will shut up and you can enjoy Sam Elliott singing I Won't Back Down while he fucking karate fights seven coyotes? I get it. But, like, eh, there's no one else who really vies for control of the barnyard. There's no scar. There's no... I can't think of the guy's name in Hamlet, and I feel really bad about it. The uncle. The yeah, uncle, no. Yeah. It, what this movie really is, truly at its heart, is is a western. Like yeah. it is a it, it is the the ranch has been attacked by bandits, and the son now has to step up to be the the patriarch of the of the you know of the the barnyard and like this whole thing about him needing to learn responsibility and take over <laughs> after his spot his his adoptive father like tried to to impart that in him and like yeah it's uh, more importantly it's not original whatever it is oh i mean the really interesting thing is... about talking it's not original is you say western i think the samurai films and what were westerns if not westernizations of samurai films I think admittedly so, yeah, right? A like, lot of those guys were straight up openly watching like Kurosawa and then just remaking those movies. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. cause the fight stuff, like that that moment where he is fighting off the seven coyotes both times feels so like old school samurai ninja kung fu film with like the mm-hmm. fight choreography yeah. and everything. Or like the yeah. hundreds of people on top of it and then the burst through. Like those do not feel like Western moments, because Westerns. No, it's almost it's almost anime in a lot of in a yeah. lot of moments. Yeah, which is and it's beautiful. Like it really works for this film, and those blew me away. Like those when that happened, I'm like, oh, it's just gonna be him and the coyote. That and then I'm like, oh no, look at it, and then throwing the coyotes to hurt the other coyotes. I mean, they make a meal of that. Both fights use that, but it is pretty fucking great in so many ways. The other thing is, we talk about, like, it's this patriarch who's trying to impart how to be a leader into his younger son, but there's also this really nice underlying current of Ben's method of leadership being a bit outdated for the modern animals. Or at whole- the very least, Ben's style of leadership works for Ben, but it doesn't necessarily work for Otis. Right. Well, I guess the the main thing that I'm focusing on in that is the gray market using the gopher network to purchase human goods. 
Mm-hmm. And the only person who seems to be against that is Ben. Considering the fact that they turned the barn into a nightclub every night, they basically turned it into the roadhouse from Roadhouse. And if we yeah, have I, I would argue that's not great though right like it's not like see this is working and there's no problems with this there is a level of danger that comes along with that that is pretty unnecessary in a lot of moments well of course it brings it draws the attention of the maria bamford voiced neighbor uh so which could cause them trouble i love siren pizza a pizza company that like just drives around in a cop car that's such a dumb bit but so good like that moment when the car pulls up and you think it's the cops and then it's this these two and and the whole added level of that bit of there being two pizza two guys, people in there yeah exactly completely unnecessary because there's so many beautiful shots where the car's driving and you see the two people in it and you're like oh wow they're, they're really in trouble right there's nowhere else this can go <laughs> and then the arm when the fake arm falls and the guy being like i got an arm yeah yeah like that is bit, yeah. is good. It's a good little bit. It works, but it is one of those things where that barn, the fact that they're playing cards, the fact that they're playing pool, means that for most of the other animals on the barnyard, they do not have this fear of what using human objects will bring instilled in them. Right. And it's right. And, yeah. It's it's especially beautiful in that bit of product placement where he's like, we're not going to use human things. And then, hello, Moto. And everyone turns and looks at Otis. And they're not looking at Otis like, oh, my God, I can't believe you have a phone. They're looking at him like, why the fuck is your ringer on in this meeting? You're going to get us all in trouble, you stupid bastard. <laughs> like, it's it's that moment. It's that yeah. It, 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 and that's beautiful because that is totally shown, not told. The way that everybody turns and reacts is not, oh, but your son can have a phone, you fucking hypocrite. It is totally, why the fuck is your phone going off? Because you're going to get us all in trouble now. What is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. No, there is something to the idea that, that, like, yes, everybody is breaking the rules. And so, like, having this guy in charge that's constantly, like, up everybody's ass, he's got to stick up his ass. And, like, but but there's never a moment where you're showing that his leadership is necessarily wrong. Like, there's no moment where Ben's overzealous leadership leads to something bad happening for other people. The truth of the matter is, is that if they all just listened to Ben, they would all be much safer. But they don't want to. <laughs> and Otis gives them a nice little other option. Option in that he's also going to play along but there's there's a level of responsibility that must be taken like the fact that there is no no follow-up like days after like seeing like it, it, it's that 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 stuff doesn't go away or at least die down a little bit once they all kind of come to the realization that like ben was truly like keeping them safe because i think that that's really where the story is right is this idea that with otis and with the other animals they don't take the threats as seriously as they should because ben does such a good job guarding them from them but the unfortunate thing about that and this is why i think the movie doesn't it kind of stumbles a bit in in its storytelling is that it it doesn't ever really see them face true consequences for that as much as there is some of the silliness that happens they get away with it right and a kid that gets away with it is not going to learn to not do it again that kid's going to learn oh i can do this i was told i shouldn't but i got away with it and didn't get in trouble so all that reinforces the ability to continue to do it right and that's a shame because we are we are so led to believe in the first 30 to 40 minutes of this movie that like ben truly is like keeping the all these animals safe and doing this 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 honest work and is right about all of this but then nobody truly ever learns from ben <laughs> Yeah, it's it is weird that they don't there are zero consequences for that moment where um the freaking all hell breaks loose. Basically, they're like Otis is going to be the new leader despite Otis not being there for that vote. And then he comes back to the barn and the club is open during the day and like the turtles are all on little balloon parachute machines and everything has gone crazy. And the fact that you know what would be crazy? If the farmer lark locked the barn, right? Like a cop right. comes out and is like, you know, we got some noise complaints. And then he thinks, oh, it must be some kids breaking in here, like try- causing a ruckus. So I'm going to lock the barn. And then if the barn is locked, 
they like can't get in there to have that, like then it y- y- there are zero consequences for any of their actions. Right, you're right, right about right. that. Like it's right, and, it, and so that's where like this movie really does like it has its ups and its downs because like I think story wise a lot of things just happen because in this particular tropey story that's just how they happen, right? And there's like some really um kind of. Uh, there's some, some, not loose threads, but there's some places where the movie wants to go, but then doesn't. And it's just a bit of a bummer. Like, like the animals going into the real world aspect of it, like feels like a missed opportunity that there isn't more shenanigans in that way. Right. Like, like now they're, they're, they're spending more time interacting with the humans. Like it's a, um, that's like I said, just missed opportunity for me. Yeah. The places where yeah. this movie shines is in things like the style of the characters or, I mean, the direction, right? Like, Odekirk is the one that directs this one, right? Yes, that's and correct. Like, there's just some beautifully shot moments. Like, the entire coyote attack when when Ben uh, defends the hens and stuff like that. Like, that entire, like, startup to it and everything, it, it's, it is legitimately, like scary like nightmare inducing kind of moments of like shadows and movement or um or later again with the coyotes when they're chasing that hare through the woods and they're like there's the the camera going in and out of the trees and under the fall uh the felled trees and stuff like that like that that stuff is just beautifully done right so like the ways in which this movie sticks with you and hits you like are really kind of awesome it's just a bummer that there's so much in this movie that just kind of just goes nowhere falls flat feels like uh feels like oh i thought this was what this movie was going to be about and it's not like there there's a lot of that sort of stuff going on you know there's there's the way it falls back on some really weird dumb kid humor that that watching on my own here down in in, in the basement as i you know as we get ready to record for today like i did i was laughing just as much as i probably was 10 years ago but it probably is the kind of thing that I wouldn't want to be showing to my family now, right? Like, this isn't a movie I would recommend that we watch because this is just so not in the the taste of my family in terms of this kind of movie. I get that. Uh, and that seems like I wanted to make sure I got this off in the first 30 minutes because one of the other reasons that we're doing this time capsule episode is I made a comment in the FOMUCON episode, uh, the FOMUCON report, our 380th episode, which like just blowing my mind a little bit there, um, that it what bothered me about this film on a on a real level is the fact that Otis is a male cow with an udder, and not eight hours after that episode had been released, I was confronted face to face by somebody who's like, so what? Like you're anti-trans? You you don't that you have a problem with that? You have a problem with Otis being a uh, mask presenting trans? And I'm like. No, that's not what it is at all. It's just in 2006, like that, I couldn't get on board with that. And I found from the Nickelodeon magazine from October 2006, the explanation as to why they have udders. And this is what I said. Like, I'd like to hear something from the writer and director explaining it. It's from the letters page. And someone wrote asking about the anatomically incorrect bovine and whether or not it was intentional. Uh, Writer and director Steve Odekirk said, I thought it would be funny for the male cows, open parentheses, bulls, close parentheses, to have udders. So it was all in search of humor. There's no deeper meaning that was layered upon that by the writer and director. It's what Siege is talking about, about just like that style of humor that they thought kids would find funny is what is in this movie. Like the joke with the like the bee up the fl- up, up the, the pig's, pig's nose, nose. And he, like, and then he like snorts it out, and they're like, "Hey, there's a dead bee in your nose," and he like snorts it out, and the bee flies away, and he goes, "Oh, it's not dead." Like that's the bit. Like that's yeah, the like that's, that's funny. just that's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, okay, but like then, so the other thing was still like this, like you need to just get past it, Devin. Just get past it. But I had remembered in my head. That, like, in Back in the Barnyard, maybe the females don't have udders. That's not the case in the movie. And I would be completely fine if everybody had an udder, right? Like, if every single bovine that is shown in this film has an udder. But there is the, like, mechanical man ride that a bull is riding, and he does not have an udder. Because it totally works with the whole, like, nipples for men thing from Time Bandits, right? Like, male humans have nipples why would they have that i'd be okay if in this world male cows 
also have udders. Like, it's like the nipple thing. But it just, when you show a bull, when you show actually, like, I don't know. And then at the end, when they're like, oh, it's a beautiful baby boy. And it's like, how are you knowing that it's a boy? It's like sexing chickens. Your world bothers me. I'm going to be honest about it. I just need to say that. But I was happy to find that Oda Kirk was asked about it by somebody else because it means that I'm not alone in 2006 seeing these trailers being like, but that, but Kevin James, is Kevin James playing a female? That's something. That, no, he's just, he's a boy who has an udder. Okay. Um, that I can't get there. So someone else felt that way. And Oda Kirk's like, yeah, don't worry about it. It's just a funny talking animal movie. Please move past it. I have. And I'm trying to. But you got to understand. Yeah. You got to understand that, like, I am a person who in my seventh grade class, we read The Grapes of Wrath. And if you know how The Grapes of Wrath ends... Um, I guess I'll, I'll spoil the Grapes of Wrath in this Barnyard episode. We're going to be talking about George Orwell in a few moments anyway. So I guess it works. He's like dying and they come upon this family and a nursing mother offers him milk from her breast. And my seventh grade English class reading that book could not get behind it. They were all grossed out by that scene. And I'm like, I don't know why that bothers you. The milk that you drink, well, like, <laughs> I will, I will say, like, as, it, like, that is also part of the point of that scene. Like, not so that, not that it is like so. Gr- I, it, that's so. That's an interesting conversation to have, and it's unfortunate that you had it with so many young people because I don't know if they were mature enough to really wrap their head around that conversation. Like, the feeling that you're having of that that discomfort because of how this is out of the norm is like. Y- yeah, right. Like, exactly. That's, that's how right. bad the situation like, was. He that, would that die he if he didn't in, forced do into that. this situation to like, do this, right? Yeah, but they were all like, they didn't want to get to that level of it. They just like, it's so gross that he's drinking that woman's breast milk. And I'm like, I don't know why. Like, he's dying. It's what's necessary. It's what the whole book has been about. That these people, in order to try to live through this terrible time in our nation's history... This is what they were reduced to. And I got called down to the principal's office for saying that, for like being pro on the ending of Grapes of Wrath. And I like still like that has stuck with me. So like stuff about that, it always kind of hits me a little bit weird because I'm thinking about like the kid who sees this movie and then thinks that there are boy cows and girl cows. And like cow Mm -hmm. is also a term that like, Specifically means female in the whole ungulate like family, like I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I know that it's my own prejudices that I'm bringing to this movie, but it was something that made it. It's one of the reasons why I didn't watch it until 2024. Like I'm just gonna say that 2024. I don't know how you're supposed to say it. I imagine it's just 2024. No, but but again, this it's not like this is some like huge groundbreaking <sighs> change in in like you know in the dynamic of film. Like this is a movie that was mostly not watched and mostly forgotten. Yeah, that that led to a show that is never truly like held up in the in those conversations. You know, we mentioned other shows already. This this that are much more um, uh, part of the canon, right? You know, like things like Fairly Odd Parents, things like SpongeBob around this time were definitely the the more, Jimmy Neutron, were definitely the more impactful ones, right? Barnyard just doesn't land, right? And and I think that for a lot of people, for this is what you're getting at, right? Like is the, the stuff that you're talking about is the stuff that, that we're really getting at. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, that, thank you. I appreciate you you saying that. And you know what else is weird? You don't get... Oh, no, I guess September 29th. Wow. The turnaround on the series is insane. Like, a year later, they they had the first season out. And well, that was, it, that's because yeah. that's part of the plan. Yeah. Right? Like, that's... that. It's not... It, like, <sighs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, it's... It's it, it's not... That's also not new to animation. No, right? Like, right. that's something that we, t- we have... We have talked about and praised when we talk about, like, the Disney after... Like, the Disney Saturday morning, right? And Or Disney afternoon, whatever it was, with, like, Tailspin, Darkwing Duck, and Goof Troop. And about how, like, the... It was so cool that those all started with, like, a movie-long thing that you could, like, like, really get into and then led into those shows, right? Yeah, that's true. I don't know. It's just, it's, I, I can't believe that. That's awesome to me that like within a year they were ready to do it. 
because that's the other thing. Like, I feel now the the weight between the film and the adaptation, like the four TV adaptation, is insane. Like, Knuckles just came out. And we, the last Sonic the Hedgehog movie came out, what, two years ago? Like, it's, like, I don't know, two years seems like the Sonic the Hedgehog cycle, so I don't know. But you'd think Sonic the Hedgehog, he's the well, fastest thing alive. Yeah, right? and in like, that, you are also talking about Knuckles, what you're also talking about a, very specifically in the case of Knuckles, which I think this is, like, they're both paramount, right? So Yeah, it, they're it both is, paramount, that's it, why I bring it up. Parallel. Yeah. Right, um, is that when you're making, when they're making Knuckles, they're doing something different than when they're making the barnyard tv show the barnyard tv show has a lot of the voice cast move over but not the big guys the barnyard in terms of the animation the animation dips immensely if you watch the show versus the movie right there's a lot going on there as well so there's there's something about in terms of quality part of that is the time 2006 to 2007 is a very different time in terms of animation and what we expect out of our both animated movies and animated shows is very different also when they're making Knuckles, like, they are being very careful about making sure that it, it doesn't do anything like, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Retcon anything from, from the two movies you've seen already slash movies you're going to see. Because they have plans for that to be an ongoing universe that they're going to care for, right? That that kind of love and attention is not being paid to Barnyard. And it sure as hell isn't being paid attention to in Back at the Barnyard, right? Like, there is there is not the same level of expectation or artistic desire going into either of these things as there is in Sonic and, and the Knuckles tv show that accompanies it right um and i think that speaks a lot to what we expect now from from these kinds of properties versus what we did then you know i I think there's a very different audience and audience expectation for this kind of stuff and and it leads to there being more time i will say that in terms of the level of quality and care I think the more apt thing is to look at like DreamWorks and what ends up on Netflix within a year after a show comes out, right? I think there's a Trolls TV show that was out. I think there was a Turbo TV show that was out. I think those are much more in line with this, and I don't think you're getting that same two-year wait of fans on on the edge of their seat waiting for the Turbo the Snail show to come out. That's just not happening. <laughs> Let me tell you, Turbo is one of my favorite movies. I love Turbo. Turbo blew me away when I saw it. I have not watched the Turbo TV show. And that's right. that's just a true statement that I can make. Right. There's, you know, but it's it's entirely about like what the audience what audience are they aiming for? What audi- what does that audience expect? What is that audience okay with? You know, and sometimes there's some really gross decisions being made in that regard where they're not going to put any effort into a thing and just pump it out really just so they could sell the toys on the other end, right? I don't know if that's necessarily the case here because I don't remember the last. I, I don't remember there being a large run on on Otis dolls or anything like that, right? Um, well, that's like Nickelodeon has historically been very behind the the times when it comes to merchandise for their original properties. Like that's one of the craziest things about it. Those original three Nicktoons, they had a lot of deals with like Pizza Hut and fast food things to tie into that, but you couldn't get a Rugrats like action figure or doll for like four years after uh, yeah, I, there, those came remember, out. Remember, yeah, the, the thing to keep in mind is at the time, um, in the early 90s, Nickelodeon very much was coming out as a response, as an as an antagonist to the whole Disneyfication of children's entertainment at that time. Yeah. You know, run by MTV. It was going to come out here and it was going to break down barriers and, like, do something different. And that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. You know, I, I think to this day, people of our generation and a couple of years below us, like – um could probably tell you stories about how they weren't allowed to watch Rugrats. And if you watch Rugrats, you're like, why, why? Meanwhile, we were all sitting around watching South Park without question. And it was like this weird thing of like, there was something about like Rugrats and Ren and Stimpy um, and Rocco that like, we weren't, we just weren't allowed to watch Nickelodeon cartoons, right? And I, and I'm, this is not like none of us were. Obviously, we, you and I did. We we have these memories of them. We talk about them all the time. I will say there were certain members of my family that 
when they found out that my mom let me watch Rugrats, raised an eyebrow and like had like some thoughts about that that I remember being expressed and her, and and her being like, "Have you ever watched the show?" Because like it's actually very sweet, like that kind of thing, right? Um, my grandmother like bringing me to go see the Rugrats movie and finally being like, "Oh, is that what this is all about?" I don't know what I thought this was. And that <laughs> like, one's yeah, scary. Yeah. If you're gonna get mad about something Rugrats related, the Rugrats movie is the one to get mad about. Because that is when they are in the most danger that those stupid babies... Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm channeling Angelica when I say that. Have ever been in. They are lost in the woods and there are escaped monkeys that could eat their faces off. Like, that is well, the I plot of the a, Rugrats movie. There was a very... <laughs> right. I think there was a very... I mean, because of the whole MTV connection, because of the whole we're not Disney attitude, there was kind of a sense that these shows must be rude. And, you know, Ren and Stimpy <laughs> was rude, right? Whereas, like, Rugrats, not so much, and Rocco was kind of somewhere in the middle. Or, or Hey Arnold. Or hey Arnold taught me so much about like the love of a, of a community and like how family is formed and not necessarily something that you're just born in. Like, like all of these great things that I learned from Hey Arnold that like, I don't, nobody else in my family watched Hey Arnold with me. My mom and dad didn't, my, my grandparents didn't, my other, other cousins and stuff like that, that were watching it with me, their families weren't involved in watching it. So they just assumed that it was a show about a bunch of rude city kids. And it's like, no, it is so the opposite of that. You know, maybe they caught that one bad episode of like Helga, like being like a bully. Like, well, not just the one episode where she's a bully, but like there's like a couple of episodes that are focused on her. And yeah. like they thought that's what they were all like. And it's like, no, no, like that's not at all what's, what's going on in the show. Right. So when it comes to things like merchandising, it has this trickle down effect of like it becomes harder for them to really pitch this idea to places like McDonald's or like uh, Burger King. There's even some cases, and this is when we start to get a little tin hat about it, but like, like there's this idea that like Disney really was cornering the market on like shelf space at Kmart. And so because Disney was going out of their way to literally muscle out any other competition, Nickelodeon just never had a chance. So what they do instead is they kind of, they, they go in the other direction with a lot of their stuff. You get a lot of really, um, you get a lot of really cool, um, adult oriented stuff that comes from it which doesn't help in the case of them trying to sell the kids and, and adults being like well no this is clearly adult stuff see they've got t-shirts in, in the adult section at walmart they've got t-shirts or they, they've got they've got hats you can buy or, or or um or bags with their faces on them or toys that are being sold in in specialty stores like spencer's and stuff like that right and like as the years go on nickelodeon finds that its market is more like older teens right and that's where a lot of their stuff gets aimed including a lot of their programming later on yeah, um, specifically everything that you just spoke of, I was not allowed to watch The Simpsons. That is a, a story that I tell often, uh, mostly because I get to say, so I covered the screen and just listened to The Simpsons because I'm not watching it. And like that whole like shitty kid solution that I came up with. But mm -hmm. I was totally allowed to watch Ren and Stimpy. And like, and that's because my mother liked Ren and Stimpy. Like, I know that for a fact that my mother enjoyed Ren and Stimpy, so she, I, she'd let me watch it, so she could watch it too. Um, and that's like she still references Ren and Stimpy stuff. Got thirty years later, um, I remember that for her birthday, I got her a Ren and Stimpy card. When you talk about like they were targeting kids, they were targeting adults. Like, Ren and Stimpy having a birthday card in the friggin' Hallmark aisle, that's crazy. Right. Like, you think about that, that's crazy. And that was the one of the Nicktoons that also aired on MTV. But I think so much about how, like, The Simpsons was the thing that my parents tried to keep me away from. And I will also admit, there was a shift when I, like, became 10 years old. Um, maybe it was because we had just moved to Rhode Island. Or maybe it was because, like, all right, now we're at the point where, like, this stuff could... Like, he's learning what these things mean. Like, you can't see Pulp Fiction, Devin, until you're older. That type of stuff. You can't go see Showgirls until you're older. But, you know, getting taken to see Cuffs when I'm five years old and that being a formulative experience for me. Um, I also think, you mentioned Klasky Supo, Duckman. And now Duckman was an amazing show. It's on USA. And I was allowed to watch that. And that was a Saturday night only 
10.30 animated show that I was able to watch. I'd watch it in my parents' room because that's where the other TV was. They didn't have any care. And they, they let me watch Duckman. But, like, at eight, nine years old, I probably shouldn't have been watching Duckman. I will admit <laughs> that. I mean, I don't think it's had a negative effect on me. But if you're going to say you can't watch The Simpsons, I shouldn't be able to watch Ren and Stimpy or Duckman. Or, like, yeah. the midnight movie show as presented by Gilbert Godfrey on USA. Like, it was, it's one of those weird disconnects. And the reason I bring up that weird disconnect is because you saying that people were not allowed to watch Rugrats, while completely believable, is such a weird disconnect. Because of the three original Nicktoons, that was the most wholesome. But again, because of the Klasky Supo connection to Simpsons and well, something was, like Duckman. It was Nickelodeon like, in general, right? Yeah. Like around, I, I, you know, maybe this is where we start to talk about like bubbles that we grew up in and stuff. But I very distinctly remember Simpsons wasn't allowed in our either. Like, like, like Simpsons in my house specifically, Simpsons, South Park, all of that, like none of it was allowed. And Nickelodeon was something that had to be engaged with first by mom and dad. And then they would kind of decide if it was okay for us to watch. Red and Stimpy didn't make the cut, for instance. Whereas like Rugrats was fine. Um, Doug was fine. You know, like that kind of thing. Um. It's funny I call Rugrats more wholesome than Doug, but Doug is such a vanilla bitch. (laughs) I love you, Doug Yancey Funny, but come on. The norm it seemed to be, like, right, and like this and this seems to be the case as I have grown up and go to college and met other people and gone to grad school and met more people from other places. (laughs) Nickelodeon seemed to be the thing that just rubbed parents the wrong way. Disney was always allowed. As far as like your conversation about like Simpsons and like what I mentioned earlier with South Park and stuff. That was stuff was obviously not allowed. Like, like that was just that's off the table. But in the conversation of stuff that was geared at kids, because I think that's the other thing is that Simpsons and South Park and all that stuff and Duckman weren't aimed at kids. As far as stuff that was aimed at kids that we were still not allowed to interact with, like there was Nickelodeon was definitely the thing that had to you know parents had to keep an eye on, right? And that seemed to be the case for all of my friends. If it was on Disney, it was fine. If it was on CBS Saturday Morning, it was fine. You know, if it was. Um, but if it was on Nickelodeon, that had to be the thing that the parents talked about together. That was the thing that got brought up at PTA meetings type shit, right? And again, like, then there was South Park and Simpsons, but those were on a whole other level of, as far as, as, far, yeah. as our friends groups were concerned, one person in our group was the one that was allowed to watch that stuff. And that kid was the bad kid that wasn't allowed to, to, to like, come over without mom's, like, permission and stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I will say this. I remember when we moved from Lemonster... In Lake Lemonster in the trailer park, you've seen the trailer park, so I, I feel I can reference it. I lived in a trailer park for like the first six years of my life. And then my father got this really nice job and we moved out to Templeton. Have you ever seen the Templeton house that we had? I think we've driven by it, but because we don't own it, it's like I couldn't take you inside, right? Yeah. I, I, I if I, we did definitely not inside. Yes, correct. Yeah. But you've seen like the <laughs> lake not, that, you know, that, that, you know what that, I was going to say? I was going to say we didn't creepily knock on the door and ask to go inside, like, like, and like with a wink and a nod because who would do that? And then I remembered we distinctly knew a kid in college who did exactly that his very first spring break of college. <laughs> Yeah. He's like, we're going to go to the house that I grew up in down in Florida. We're going to ask the lady if I could take a picture inside. Okay, bud. Good Have luck with that. Have fun with that. We're going to be here not getting arrested. Not and getting it, shot by a shot, crazy right? old lady in Florida. Oh, man. Memories. But, like, so you saw that. That was out. That, that Templeton house was out in the middle of the woods. So that first summer that we lived there, we didn't have cable. So it was this weird sort of thing where, like, my memory at the time was that I was told I couldn't watch Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network or Disney Channel anymore. So like, it's like, you're only watching PBS. But literally, the only shows that were, like, geared towards me that were on during the day was PBS. And then eventually my father got a cable box and a black box from some friend. I won't incriminate him, but also with statute of limitations on that, right? And we were able to get cable at that house and then all bets were fucking off. Like, we've been sharing a lot with people Like that Space Ghost Coast to Coast was formulative for you and I, right? If we're mm-hmm. going to go back, like, to, to the 90s 
for, for yeah. our memories in this time capsule. Yeah, we haven't even talked about Cartoon Network in this whole thing. Yeah. Cartoon Network was such a mystifier to my parents because sometimes they'd walk in the room and I would just be, you know, watching uh, reruns of old Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and which they thought was fine. But then they'd walk in the room an hour later and I was watching The Brack Show and they were like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you need to understand that, like, Space Ghost Goes to the Coast was announced and I'm like, I want to watch this. And it wasn't on until 4 a.m., on Saturday mornings. So Dang. like Friday night, I would set up in our living room in this is still in Templeton. Like I have deep memories of this to try and stay up till four o'clock. So I'd have like Nintendo there. I'd have snacks. I'd have movies. I'd out there. Or I'd be like, I'm going to go, I'm going to sleep in the living room so that I can wake up at four o'clock and watch space ghost. Like that was another thing that was allowed, but there was that def definitive time like it was the summer going into second grade where all I watched was PBS programming. And mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm like, this is a punishment. But now I realize that like, it's just cause we didn't have cable at that house and getting cable to the house would have been stupid expensive cause it wasn't right. run to the house before. So like, I now understand that like that wasn't a punishment because in the trailer park, I watch Nickelodeon all the time. Like, my mother would be like, oh, Looney Tunes is coming on. We're going to watch it. And, like, she tried to train me on Looney Tunes and all these other things as I was younger. But then moving away from that, like, that's why I had to watch PBS. But in my head, I'm like, this must be punishment, right, for all the things. But then Nicktoons came along, and I was watching Nicktoons all the time. I was watching Snick all the time. What I will say for Nickelodeon, and it will tie back into Barnyard, they really knew what their target audience was interested in and what they could get away showing to them um, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, this is, this is, yeah, this movie is something else, Seijin. I'm glad that because you randomly watched it at 2 a.m., something good happened from it, and we're now talking yeah. about it, and I, and I forced myself to watch it. Um, I, I think it's one of those things where, like, it, it came along, like, 10 years too late to really have any legs, but also, like, could not have come any sooner because of the ways in which, like, it really does embrace the CGI and, and the ways in which, like, it, it plays with, like, the camera work and stuff. There's some stuff that happens in this in the direction that you get to see in an animated movie that you would never get to see if it had been hand-drawn, especially in the style that it probably would have been hand-drawn in from Nickelodeon Studios. It just, it, it, it would have been, a, it would have been a different creature. I was going to say a different animal. I guess that works. You could say the animal, It would have been right? a completely different animal of a film, right? Um, oh, the the helicopter love... chase is incredible. Like when that yeah. helicopter is chasing them through the woods and it just looks like yeah. real footage of yeah, a car yeah. chase. Like, whoa, blew me away. <laughs> and like also blew most of your budget on this because the animation got amped up like seven rungs on the ladder. <laughs> I'm like, this is yeah. so good. The way they're moving <laughs> as they run, the way the cops are chasing them, the reveal at the end of the forest that like, oh, no, there's just cows here. They must have gotten away. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah so i need you to to go back to a comment that you made uh, a little while ago and talk to me about animal farm well but the only reason i bring it up is because imdb trivia for barnyard which there's not a lot i'm just gonna say that there's like i think 22 items maybe 28 if i'm doing my math incorrectly but uh, was it loosely based on George Orwell's novel Animal Farm? Bull and shit have entered the chat. That's I think they would have been bullshit. closer if they had used Charlotte's Web because at least that's referenced in at the least movie. Like, yeah, well, the <laughs> even that is not good. <laughs> at forty three but... minutes, when the farmer is knocked out, Otis gives him a copy of the book Charlotte Web by E. B. White, the basis for the next Nickelodeon movie. So it's like Marvel Cinema. Like foreshadowing, hey, you know, we're yeah. doing Charlotte's Web next. That one's that weird live action thing, and Julia well, Roberts they, is Charlotte, but yeah, well, so so after Barnyard is when Nickelodeon gets into the to the book game, right? Because yes. the next few ones, the, the next few films that they do, not necessarily animated films, right. are like this Spiderwick Chronicles, right? Um, uh, what's the one they were doing? Series of Unfortunate um, Events, Series of Unfortunate Events, yeah. right? Yeah, like there's a ton of 
there's a ton of those that that come out in that case. Yeah. So, I mean, what I wanted to bring up about the loosely based on George Orwell's Animal Farm, this not, right? Like, there are moments that, like, wouldn't it be great? Like, when you say that it's Hamlet via the Lion King, my thought is that there's going to be somebody who challenges for, like, power in the barnyard, right? Like, Ben has clearly lost the, left a vacuum. Everybody assumes Otis, but where's friggin' um napoleon it's lion it's lion king without scar you have your you have your hyenas you have your mufasa you have your simba you just don't have scar and like yeah no it it, and that's that is not that is not a good description of this movie you should go watch it if you want a full description but you're not and if you're not going to watch it it's the best description that's going to get you there (laughs) yeah but yeah so it's like snowball is basically who otis is representing and then you don't have that napoleon and honestly you have a pretty solid representation of like who could be that in Bessie. Like imagine if Bessie is like, I would like to challenge for leadership of the barnyard, right? She's new on the farm. She doesn't have any respect for Otis. And then the whole connection for Daisy, the fact that like her and Daisy come from the same farm. They were taken in after I have to imagine like a tornado, took the rest of their herd away <laughs> based on the story though they say they the went told, yeah. yeah though they say they went to high ground which i mean tornadoes generally do hit valleys but i'd also maybe think oh my god did they all drown cuz uh, cuz like rockadoodle right cuz everybody drowns in rockadoodle adequate pipe um but yeah like it's the fact that nobody else challenges for control of the barnyard is a mm-hmm. weird misstep Cause, cause then, then I would agree that it's loosely based on Animal Farm. There ain't no Animal Farm in this book, in this movie at all. Like mm-hmm. it's that's a like oh animals walk on two legs. I guess we can say it's loosely based on Animal Farm. But that's the end of Animal Farm. The whole thing of Animal Farm is four legs good, two legs bad. So we, what are you what are you talking about? They they just yeah. missed the opportunity yeah. where like if there had been and Bessie would be the best choice because I think it would be funny to see Wanda Sykes. And Kevin James fighting to be the leaders of this little community, right? There is a weird joke being made with her having a meat tag on, right? Oh yeah, definitely. You are it, not. I alone was trying in to. That. Yeah. The closest. Okay, here's the thing: is I could not quite figure out what the joke was. The closest I could figure out is they're trying to call her "quote unquote" Butch because she wears a butcher's tag. That is like the closest thing to a joke I think I could figure out with that though. I for, I was like, why is she a meat cow? Everybody else is a dairy cow supposedly, well, and now Jersey she's on a, cows, what we believe to understand to be a dairy farm. But like, <laughs> the Jersey cows are all meat cows as well. They all have the tags on too. Oh, they all have tags yeah, too. Yeah, okay. because what okay, bothered so meat cows? Yeah. So this movie, uh, here's a little a little behind the scenes of how I watched Barnyard. Um, I put on the film. Uh, so I'm like, I'm just going to, I'm going to watch until I'm not able to watch anymore. Uh, and I was able to get to, ironically, the same spot I've only gotten to in Barnyard, Sam Elliott singing, I won't back down. And then stuff happened and I had to stop the movie. And then I had like the 90 minutes uninterrupted. So I rewatched the whole, the film in, 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 in one whole sitting without any interruption. But the second time I noticed the Foley work that they did for her meat tag. And I'm like, that sounds like a a bell, but nobody's wearing a bell. Like no one has a a cowbell on, but it like, that's sort of what it sounded like the tag. And that's when I realized, Oh, "Oh, she has this tag. And then I'm like, that's, that's weird. Cause the first time that I watched that scene where Daisy and Bessie are introduced, um, I, I was thinking about the fact that, like, Daisy is just Miss Pac-Man. Like, we know she's a girl because she has a bow on her head. Because she gets a bow on her head. Like, well, especially because the idea that we have now met meat cows, the, the Jersey boys, that are bulls, right? <laughs> they have udders, too, though. Like if They, they have horns? They have udders? They have, they have udders. I don't know if they have horns. Okay, there is one bull in this movie for sure. Because in def- the party scene, yeah, he's right at in the-, the pool table, and then he is the one later that that is at the um at the table and and falls over. I forget like his chair gets pulled. Yeah, out or but something. Bessie steals is- two chairs 
is one of the right, right. It and is, he rides the mechanical so man. De- there is definitively a bull in this movie. There are utter. There's an utterless bull in this film that does exist. He's fucking everybody. Um, he has to be. That's what bulls do. That's why you have one or two bulls on a farm like this for procreation reasons. This is the type of stuff that the class marches out and tells the principal you're sa- you're talking dirty and saying disgusting things for the record. Being just frank about how our world works, but you in seventh grade and advanced seventh grade where the 30 of you are taking an eighth grade um, curriculum, but they don't want to call you eighth graders. Sorry, the chip is off my shoulder. It's just as I'm describing why there has to be one bull in this movie, I'm just having the flashbacks to me describing that, like, if you had cereal this morning, you had breast milk, but it came from a cow, not a human woman. But we're all all right with that? Like, we're okay with that? (laughs) He was starving, Seijin. But yes, there are that. So that is actually the fact that she is butch with the butch tag. I get that. We recently covered PCU, recently from the time of recording, not necessarily from when you're listening to this, covered PCU. Bessie giving off big womenist vibes in her relationship with Daisy. Yeah. Like, I, you know, it's the it's the dominant best friend who's who's probably seen some shit like that's the secret of those characters right is like the 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 quote-unquote bitchy best friend which shows up in these in these love stories all the time i is not a fair moniker for them because i think more often than not what it is is that these are the characters that have grown up a little bit more and have seen some some things break bad in a way that maybe our main characters have not always yeah they're they're calloused because they've experienced some shit and they, yeah. then they always paint it off as like, oh, you're a terrible person. But it's like, no, like she, this woman is the only connection that Daisy has to her former husband and the father of the child. That's a, that's another thing I'm going to complain about right now is 59 minutes into the episode. Um, and I'm going to complain about the fact that like, oh my God, you're pregnant. But there's like no way for me as the viewer to understand that she is pregnant like like there's no curve to show a pregnant belly and i understand that like for a cow that's not necessarily how it is but otis is like oh god you're up you're up pregnant like oh okay thanks for that exposition because i wouldn't have known thank you for telling and not showing (laughs) yeah like it's such a it's such a weird thing. And then it's made even weirder because Nickelodeon's like, you fucking wrote yourselves into a corner with the fucking single mom and her baby. Get rid of them for the show. Make up a new lady. And she'll also be friends with Bessie. But you got to get rid of Daisy and her baby. Nobody wants to see that in the funny animal TV show. Which also, this seems like a time for me to read this Because holy fuck, in terms of what an episode is, the fourth episode, there there were like two 11 minutes for every episode of Back in the Barnyard. And I know this is only tangentially required. Thank you, audience and Seijin, for indulging me in this. The second episode, 4B, is called The Farmer Takes a Woman. And here's the description. The animals are (laughs) unable to have Saturday night parties because of the farmer constantly crying over his late wife. Like that's the inciting action of an episode of back at the barnyard. Yeah. 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 And then Otis finds him the perfect girlfriend, but it turns out that she's a gold digger. It's kind of like that show that you can watch on Farks. Farmer wants a wife where it's a bunch of farmers who own like million dollar properties who are like, I'd really like a husband. And it's like city mouse meets uh, country mouse sort of culture clash BS. Um, yeah, but the, like the fact that the animals can't party because the farmer's mourning his dead wife. That's Jesus, a beautiful. That's the, the there's the start of a kids show right there. Oh man, <laughs> like it's yeah I, weird that they're not going back to the well on this one with all the other sequels they put out. Right. I mean, <laughs> speaking of other sequels. Rugrats just blown off of Paramount Plus without much of an explanation at all. I don't mm. know what that's about, but that's the thing that happened. So even if they had gone back to the well for Barnyard, which don't ever go back to a Barnyard well. I'm just going to like 
that's the secret of everything. If you've had well water in your life, you know what I'm talking about. Um, like it, I, I don't know if the if it would even still exist or if it would be the way that most of the Paramount Plus like re uh, I don't know reunion revisitation shows have just been blanked from existence. Fairly yeah. Otter Parents is gone. Rugrats is now dead media. Like, I, if you haven't seen Zoe 102, I, I haven't, so I can't give a recommendation either way. Maybe you want to watch that before it's dumped to crumpet. Because uh, they are... The purge that hit Max over the last couple of years is coming to Paramount+. Plus. Uh, for better or for ill. I don't know if they're actually going to sell the stuff off to Netflix to do that. Um, we're, we're hearing now that Sony has expressed interest in Paramount in addition to Tom Cruise and Skydance. So, like, we're hitting this movie at a time where its parent company is in flux. So, like, remember that what, that this was recorded in April <laughs> if it's Sony Paramount, like, tomorrow. Yeah, we may Alex Inc. this shit, not even real. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, that's just trying to get ready for this and finding, like, oh, that's still going on? Because I heard about the Sony Paramount thing, like, the 18th of April is the first time I read an article about it, and then nothing. So I thought it was, like, uh, who else was about to buy Paramount and then, like, walked away from it immediately? Um, I don't remember who. Oh, Max! Like, Time Warner was like, yeah, we're going to buy so we're gonna buy Paramount. Uh, we have no money, but we're going to buy Paramount somehow. Um, so I thought that was the same thing that happened with Sony. And then today, more information about the bidding war that is going on for Paramount. Um, which also makes it a fun time to talk about Barnyard. Um, which, getting back to Barnyard, I'd like to talk about the Jersey Cows. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. Because the first scene that we see is, like, Ben goes up to them. And I feel like they're supposed to be, like, mafia, but, like, via the Sopranos-type characters. One of them is Bender Bending Rodriguez, John DiMaggio himself. Um, the other one, Maurice LaMarche, and then I don't remember the name of the third. Uh, the actor I was getting a little bit of, like, Jersey Shore um, entourage off of them more than I was Sopranos. Like, they don't feel like... Like, they feel like the kind of guys that's, that sell stolen cell phones, but they don't necessarily steal the cell phones. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're corner boys to use the, the terminology from the TV. Uh, the last one is Scott Bullock. He plays Eddie DeCow. Uh, just to, to give the, the, the stuff, right? We should Everybody's name should be shared. Um, yeah, it's just, like, Bud seems to think that they're, like, this dangerous element who's, who's and they're going to corrupt his son. Meanwhile, his son is hill surfing in what looks like the most dangerous thing ever. Um, this also seems like an appropriate time to bring up the fact that um, half of the original Ninja Turtle voice actors are in this movie <laughs> as Peck and, oh, what's the weasel's name? Uh, Freddy. He's actually a ferret. Uh, Peck the Rooster is Rob Paulson, your original Raphael, and later would be Donatello on the Nickelodeon Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from 2012. And then Freddy the Ferret is Cam Clark, the original Leonardo. And I kept hoping that the other turtles would show up, that um, you'd hear from the other voice actors. And that didn't happen. And I will admit I was a little disappointed by that, uh, that we didn't get some Barry Gordon or Townsend Coleman. Like, I was hoping for it the whole movie. Especially since when we talked about this the last time, we also talked about Ninja Turtles. <sighs> That's me. I think I've I've said a lot. What do you got, Sejan? Anything? <laughs> I, I no, I mean, like, at the end of the day, I think one of the things that we always do with these kinds of things is we always get to that point where we want to talk about do we recommend this or not? Yeah. And what the hell? Like, this is definitely one that I recommend. The problem comes back to what you were saying about availability. That's the real reason that I can't recommend this movie right now. With it not being readily available on, like, a streaming service or even, like, a good, like, YouTube link or something like that, like, there's really no way to really get a hold of this movie. But, like would kick this movie out of bed for eating crackers you know like if somebody showed up with this thing at a party or if it was on at, at somebody's house you know like 
in a heartbeat, like I would sit down and, and geek out to this movie and talk about some of the exact same shit that we talked about today too, right? Because that's the other big thing is that everything that we talked about today, none of this is inside baseball. Like all of this shit is like Nickelodeon and the state of where it was in the 90s and what that bore out to in the 2000s and where they are now, right? Like Barnyard is a really good jumping off point to talk about all of that, right? I agree. First of all, there's going to be like the story that kind of started this whole thing was I was in a room with people that had both never seen it and then some people who couldn't stop talking about it. So like that 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 alone, right, tells you that there's going to be something to talk about in a room full of people with watching this movie. Yeah, so I guess that is the question I wanted to have is how did how did I know how you got to the place, but how did this wind up on the television? Like, how was this what was being watched at this house party? Was it well, no, physical so remember, media? We, or... were, we were talking about this movie separately. We were playing that stupid fruit drop game. Oh, you were playing Sweaky Game, and then you just talked about Barnyard. <laughs> yeah, and people were talking and somehow got to Barnyard, and we, like, and we were talking about... Oh, God. Okay. And it was this thing where, where again, there was people in the room who had who had like never even heard of this. There were people in the room that were like, "Oh my God!" Like I, I remember Bernard. I remember the TV show. I remember all these bits and pieces of it. And somebody was just like, "What even is this fucking thing?" And then Siege and because there was no way like to get a hold king of, of it. And I was, <laughs> yeah, and I just basically was just like, "Look, if you've seen this, then you basically get it." But you know, just imagine more more fart jokes, essentially. Yeah, All right, there's that's... not as many fart jokes as I remembered. Yeah, so. they're like I don't think there's a single fart joke in this, is there? You there's know, definitely what? a fart sound effect or two, mm-hmm. but it's not necessarily a yeah. But it's not I don't like yeah because they're animals they 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 poop outside. I mean, there's a moment in, yeah, there's a moment when a mouse poops on a on. Uh, on I thought he dropped food. That is, <laughs> that is the joke of the moment. Is yeah, he is scared like he, he he's it scares the literal shit out of him right yeah. now. <laughs> I mean, Jeff Garcia as Pip the mouse. Uh, also, Sheen Estevez from Jimmy Neutron. Yeah, stepping up to the yeah, stepping yeah. to the plate from Jimmy Neutron. Yeah, I mean, in their relationship, I freaking love Otis and Pip's relationship. Um, one of the things I do remember from born, uh, back at the barnyard is when they were Cowman and Rat Boy, <laughs> as like the <laughs> Batman and Robin of the barnyard universe, and that like there and that moment where he's like, I have to go deal with this, and Pip's like, I'm coming with you, and he's like, No, you're not. Like that, that hurt. Like I cried during this movie. That's the thing that I'm going to admit is watching this film. I had emotion ripped out of me a lot. Like a lot. I was not expecting the emotional beats to hit with me the way that they did while I, I mean, was Danny watching Glover this film. has a couple. Yeah, we haven't even talked really about Danny well Glover yet. Delivered lines <sighs> that that do hit you right. Like like I mean the the. Those coyotes look strong moment, right? Like yeah. that that bit in the big climax was really good. But even some stuff earlier on where he's like talking to Ben and, and talking about um talking about Otis and like how, you know, you gotta let Otis kind of do his own thing his own way. And kind of what you were saying earlier on about like like Ben really needed to come to terms with the fact that Otis is just not him, right? Yeah. Which I think he does in his final moments. Like I think it's a I think it is something that we see in that in, in that last conversation they have and in that final moment between the two of them. That conversation, I mean that is another one that where he's like so, like, I got this thing. I want me to do this song. So, well, it's my shift. Like, I don't want to do it. But you see that realization in Ben's eyes that, like, no, he needs to let this kid also be a kid. But, like, unfortunately, that's the night where he's going to have to grow up. I mean, it's kind of mm-hmm. Batman, too. It's Batman at the barnyard in a lot of ways. <laughs> because the Desert Father All right, is... Now we thing. have to go. That With that joke, now we have to wrap things up. <laughs> You know what that then we turn to? We got to turn to the soundtrack because the soundtrack for this movie mm. is exceptional. Um, yeah. Except for, ironically, or I, maybe not using that properly, Alanis Morissette would be like, congratulations, you used ironic properly. That musical number that friggin' Otis misses his shift for is not good. Which, like, really on a meta-textual level hurts my heart like it's not like he goes and he fucking slays in that musical performance it's mid at best and that's like disappointing to me that's uh that's is that down on the farm it's i i guess it's down on the farm is the one where he's like kind of like frank sinatra he does that slide down the banister and you got his big cow ass the whole 
screen there. Like, yeah, but it's the one that he plays with the band in the barn. In the right? barn, right? yes. We, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of they've got a couple of uh, of songs on the on the soundtrack, but I, I there is only one in which Kevin James is credited with them. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's that one. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's not. It's not. It's not the best song on the soundtrack. It's not. It, the soundtrack is amazingly listenable, but not very memorable. Like that's the way that I will describe it. Yes. Like I, it, it like the movie is held up in a lot of ways by it. There's a lot of great moments in the in the movie that are helped by the soundtrack in the background. But at the end of the day, like the reason why I always reference I won't back down with and Sam Elliott in this movie is because it really is out of a movie full of music the only sticking point in the entire soundtrack including the big number that Kevin James like leaves for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like it was disappointing. Like, I'm yeah. like, oh, this is going to be freaking good because we've seen this band be really good. And then like Kevin James, it's not like he's he's no Adam Sandler when it comes to the singing, but he's not a slouch when it comes to singing. And that like there's no life in it. it it's, and the other really weird thing, you talk about how a Nickelodeon movie at this time and like the world feels kind of empty what barnyard does to make the world feel fuller or at least more kinetic and energetic is rely on this amazing soundtrack to fill that emptiness so then like when you're like you're you've done doing that up to this like 30 minute break into two moment and it's just not not even memorable let alone not even good like it was disappointing. Uh, that's that's the thing. Uh, also, going back to the Jersey cows. So then, like, I love how they just become like cool with him when they realize, like, that moment where he deals with the cow tipper. Cow tipping is not a myth. I will say that again. It happens. If it didn't happen in your town, that doesn't mean it didn't ever happen. Um, where they, he's where like, did you ever hear that cow tipping was a myth? I, I'm curious where this like <laughs> antagonistic voice has come from that. <laughs> It's um I I I'm it's totally of the time. Uh, it would age very poorly if this were an animated movie. My whole cow tipping is a myth thing would be one of those jokes that just ages like mud. Uh, which I will say for this film, I, I can't think of any jokes that were like you had to be alive in two thousand six to get it. The closest thing is the Hello Moto thing, but like it's just a ringtone, and ringtones going off at inopportune moments is probably going to be humor for like the next hundred years give or take i'll say 30 years off of that right Mm -hmm. um it's no it's so it's like this just thing on social media that a lot of people have been like talking about cow tipping is a thing that never happens that was invented by movies it's sort of like we talked about this earlier the food fight like the myth of the food fight and it just feels maybe like yeah, I think maybe what it is is like both with the food fight myth and the cow tipping myth is that the the importance <laughs> on it, like the, the over the topness of it is probably very mythological, right? Like the idea that like like a group of frat guys like require that, fr- f- you know, freshman like hazing, like they need to go out and kip, tip a cow. Yeah, that's that that part probably never happened. But like. The, the I don't know. There's something there's something weird about like the idea that like I can't believe it's never happened, but like all it has to do is happen once for movies to then reference it. I don't know. I'm like I, let me let me. I have to. This is we have to go to Google on this because I'm very confused. No, good. Like for I've it. never considered it to be something that happened as often as movies and film would as movies and television would make me believe. But like at the same time. I have to believe that at least once in the world, somebody has pushed over a cow just to see what would happen. Right. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like, I you... guess. Okay. So according to Google, there is this idea that it is generally considered an urban legend specifically based in the implication that rural citizens will seek out such entertainment due to lack of alternatives is viewed as a stereotype now. And like, I don't think I ever thought about it as like, rural kids not having anything else to do even in this very movie right it doesn't feel like that it feels like something a jerk does to establish in a story that they are a jerk right Mm -hmm. like i don't think i've ever seen a movie where i watched somebody do that or a television show where i heard about somebody doing this and thought well this person's the the good person that i should that i should grow up to become right (laughs) yeah i mean i've 
I've I've t- I've been at a cow tipping and I've instigated the food fight. I will say that I started the food fight. That that I will take. That's because I know I can start this food fight. Okay, Let's see here we happens. go. How many how many people did it take to tip the cow? Four. There we go. There, that's the other thing is that the other the other um thing in the in this like Snopes investigation I'm now doing is that they keep saying not that there's that cows weigh too much for one person to push. And again, I don't think I've ever seen it be an instance of one person walking up to a cow and pushing them over. Yeah, like it has that... always been like groups of like assholes out there. Yeah, it's a it. bunch of drunk kids. They're hanging out and they're like, oh my god, a cow, let's tip it over and see what happens. I don't know. I guess there's no recorded instances of it. I'm not seeing that truth path anywhere, but like I'm just very I, this there's a there's a level to this to this um myth that I guess I I didn't realize existed and that seems to be what everybody's calling out, but I didn't know that that existed before we even started talking about this. So 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 I guess that so here's the crazy thing. If cow tipping is just an urban legend, did Tommy Boy invent it? Like or or did it happen in something pre Tommy Boy? Because it historically it doesn't work in Tommy Boy, right? Which is the only cow tipping scene that always jumps to mind is when he's trying to impress Rob Lowe and he's like, "We're going cow tipping," and he ends up falling face down into the the cow shit. Which is again like the idea is that he's a buffoon and he's also not a farm kid, right? Like, right, exactly. He's... They live in Ohio, but like there are some farms around. But he is, but his, yeah, right. The, there are farms nearby, but he is not a farmer. No, no, right? he lives, he is not he's a an upper rural class kid, person. Right? Like, right, exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just this whole thing. And I'm like, but I mean, I live in Coventry. Like, it's a thing that there'd be a bonfire and then some people might wander off and do this. This, this feels like somebody being really super obstinate or being like super like, when you argue like the sky is blue and they're just like, well, there's actually clouds. So the sky is really polka dotted white. And you're just like, fuck off. Like, you know what I was getting at? <laughs> I believe we call that Paisley. Fucko. Jesus. I don't know. No, no. That's, um, I don't know. It's, it's just this thing that like, I've, if I'd seen it just one time, I don't think it would have stuck with me, but it's been like a thing that I've just seen in the corners of my social media. And then like online. And I'm like, but it's a thing that I've done. And I get it. I understand. Because there are people who are like, food fights never happen. And it's, well, food fights happen, but like, they don't happen like they do in the movies. Were you right? ever told that tipping cows could hurt them? Yes. Okay. That, that if you tip I a cow, I... it could kill you. It'll kill them. Because all their, but... all their organs from the pressure. I don't believe that. That seems no, they crazy. lay down. Cows lay down on the reg. Why would yeah, you, why, why would, would falling over kill a cow? I I had never heard that. So yeah, that the is cow new. part. That, that. Um, and that is and that is definitely a myth, which is definitely something. So again, there are details about cow tipping that I am seeing people argue left and right. But in terms of the act of it actually happening, there isn't anybody out there that can say it's never happened. They're just saying that like. No, you're not going to kill a cow if you tip it over. Well, okay, I didn't think I was going to. <laughs> I didn't think that God's perfect animal would die if it got tipped over. That's where I want to end this. Why is the cow the perfect animal? Somebody, I, I could tell you his name, I'm not going to do this. And I want to say to everyone, I do not ascribe to this. I, Devin Decker, am reporting on the beliefs of another human being that I had a conversation with in high school. And that is the fact that the cow can either be the argument for like the, the planned universe thing, right? Creationism, because God gave us an animal that we can get like sustenance from both food and like drink and we can get clothing from it. Like it's this perfect animal for that. But then the other argument is there can be no God because the cow has to have been something that was genetically engineered by humans in order to fulfill all of our needs. And like, that's crazy. That's animal 11 levels of insanity for me. Cause you know, animal 11, right? Sejin, you know, this myth, this is a myth. This is what this episode has turned into is discussing no, various no. myths. Is that is that the is that the creature in the box in this movie? No, Mike Ah, oh, frick Dirty Mike. What is his name? Crazy Dirty Mike. Mike. <laughs> I don't think crazy it's Dirty Mike. Mike. I think it's Crazy Mike. It's Crazy yeah. Mike. What is Crazy Mike? 
I don't know. Uh, dirty Mike, apparently, now. That's yeah. all I'm ever calling him. <laughs> well, he reminds me of this character that my mom taught me to draw when I was younger called um, Shag. And it's just you draw a bunch of lines and it looks like it's uh, it kind of like Captain Caveman, basically. Like, I don't know. Well, you know what I was thinking is this is a, of a time uh, where we get some really early memes. And I was thinking of what was that like Crazy creature? Frog? The, well, so like it was like a mix of Crazy Frog and the Golden Grams like creature, right? Oh, like, I remember Grams that being a thing there. that went around in front. Yeah. And then there was yeah. the there, there was um, I think the Invention Club had like a thing that looked like that. Like, yeah, there, there was all sorts of silly. Like, it just foots. really seems to be buying into that. Like the the the. the the silly meme thing that like, yeah. right. Like we can get a, we can get a good gif of this going around on, on fucking what, what would it have been at the time? Fucking you the man cheese, now dog college humor, you know, you the yeah, man yeah. now dog. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, with the freaking that song's really good. That plays when crazy Mike is out. Um, but yeah, no, it's like the, the animal 11, right. We're talking about barnyards um, is a, the, the chicken that KFC uses they are bred to have four breasts and 11 legs, and they technically don't have, like, a brain when they're oh, born. Right. The myth. I, That's I, I, the rem- myth. I remember the conversation we were having now, and I just yeah. I snapped back. Sorry, yes, yes, sorry, sorry. Of, uh, yes, okay, yeah. So, like, that, like, someone saying that the cow was genetically engineered so that we could have food and drink and clothing from it is, like, crazy but then like my argument would be like if yeah but then if you tip it over it dies like come on we're not gonna give it some shock absorption you, you idiot <laughs> i don't know why well so the crazy thing about that is it it is it's got the entire concept flipped we developed leather because the animal that we had skin from was a cow not exactly. we didn't we didn't know what leather was and then go that cow will make it for us. <laughs> like, or let's create an animal that can create this thing for us it's like that's such a backwards ass way it, it, this is a person who said that to me and i'm just like man maybe i'm not gonna hang out with you anymore maybe like Maybe there's another level. Like, this is the kind of guy who saw The Matrix and was like, we live in a simulation. All you got to look at is the cow. They're like, cool. That's a cool way to live. I'm going to go this way. And Devin never saw that person again. Uh, but I did. Yeah. And and I had a fights with his father because he was a friggin' physics teacher. And now we're getting too deep into my own well of uh, stuff. But I like that we're recording this on Tuesday, right? Trauma Dump Tuesday. I get to share some of my trauma in this episode. <sighs> Anything else you want to talk about, Barnyard? No, no. Right. Um, I really don't. <laughs> I guess I'll say this. Uh, from our latest non-sponsor, though if you want to sponsor us, Applebee's, We'll be eating good in the neighborhood. This film made me want to try their new crazy burger. Are you familiar with Applebee's new crazy burger? That has yeah. Yeah. yes. I uh, uh, sorry, but you got to describe it for everybody so that we're all. On the no, same I'm going to get that. I'm, I just want to make sure you, I have the name here. It's I think it's the Lotta Bacon Burger. <laughs> let me let me bring it up to make sure. Applebee's whole lot of bacon burger. So they put bacon bits into the patty when they're making the patty. And then while they're grilling the patty, they grill it on top of bacon bits and then flip it onto more bacon bits. Um, There is like six strips of bacon on top of it. And they've developed a sauce that is like a bacon sauce. So I can only imagine it's like bacon grease and bacon gr- uh, bits whipped and pureed together to make a sauce. It was the sloppiest burger I have eaten in some time, but it was <laughs> delicious. Like my hands were covered in bacon dripping. I loved it. It was absolutely great. And the reason why I felt the need to have this, not just the fact that it's been marketed all the time, but after watching Barnyard and I'm like, oh, I saw a cow and a pig hanging out and a little mouse jumping between them, naming the cuts of beef that can come from them. Pip is a great character. And I give all the credit to Jeffrey Garcia. Just like being insane in his delivery of that stuff. That scene where he's jumping off of Otis's udder to pig's stomach and being like, filet mignon, pork chops, hamburger, bacon. That's morbid as fuck. Dark. For this movie. 
Uh, but yes. Uh, so as Seijin said, um, I I would also recommend this one. It is very difficult to find. Um, we I, we did find it available to rent on Amazon Prime. Again, they're not a sponsor in any way, shape, or form. No matter how big a fan of us Jeffrey Bezos is, um, we're not getting any money from saying it. We're just pointing you in a direction where if after hearing us talk about Barnyard, you want to check it out, this is where the only place that it's available right. as of the recording yeah. date of this April 30th. But again, I will remind you what I said is that I, I can't in good conscience recommend that way of viewing it because like you're going to pay for it and have it for 24 hours. And that's not like you're going to pay too much for only getting this for 24 hours. If this yeah. was the kind of thing where like for five bucks, you could buy this at Walmart and then you'd have it in perpetuity. So at any point in your life, you could watch it again. That might be worth it. But generally, I do not believe one viewing of Barnyard is worth the four dollar and some odd cents price it's tag. Five dollars to Amazon. rent it. It was on sale. Like they knew what we were doing, but yeah, yeah it's a yeah. five dollar yeah. rental. Yeah, I, I can't. I cannot, in good conscience, say that yeah. that is a proper use of your money. Yeah. Or even the, or even if you spend the fifteen dollars to own it, I doubt you'd watch this movie the three times to get your value back to buy mm-hmm. it and own it until the license is revoked from you. So that that's where we're at with it. Uh, But this has been the Barnyard episode. It's a time capsule. We'll be back with new content hopefully next week. But until then, William, please bring us home. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your hosts Devin Decker and Seaton Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.